Well, good day and welcome everybody to your fifth web clinic. So we've got two more to go, but today is your fifth web clinic and it's on building capability. So this is improving your salespeople's ability to go out and do the things that they need to do in order for you to achieve the revenue goals that have been set for you. So as we begin today, I want to pose a question to you. And the question is this. What would the impact be on you and your sales team and your organization if you were able to increase your sales revenue by 10%? I'm sure the impact would be significant. Well, here's the thing. If you'd like to increase your revenue by 10%, the question you really have to be asking yourself is, are your people really 10% better? Because if they're still showing up doing the same things, then it stands to reason that they can only get, really, the same result. Folks, before we get started today, I want to let you know that, really, today's session is probably one of the most important lessons that you will learn in terms of driving up sales volume. If you recall, when we got together last time on our last web clinic, we looked at the impact of ramping up productivity. We looked at the impact of increasing the P for productivity. And the fact of the matter is that if you want to get quick runs on the board, yes, you ramp up productivity. Why? Because we know that there is a huge capacity there for the majority of sales teams to do more. And that's where you're going to get the quick runs on the board. However, today looks at a brand new ball game. So I want you to imagine, imagine for a moment, imagine that we didn't increase productivity at all. Your people were still making the same amount of calls, your people were still seeing the same amount of customers, your people were still completing the same amount of activities. Yet the only thing that we did differently, we increased the impact of their interactions within each of those actions. And we're able to change the end result of those sales activities. What would the impact be on your business? So let me give you an example of this. Let's say currently you have a salesperson and they are on the phone and let's say one of their sales activities is to set up a sales appointment. Let's say at the moment we know that if they will make 25 calls they will get two appointments. In other words, if they speak to 25 potential prospects, based on their current level of skill, their current ability, they'll pick up two appointments. Now, what if we could improve the quality of that individual's interaction with that prospect? So much so that it actually impacted the outcome of that interaction. In other words, they were able to now, instead of just getting two out of 25, they were able to ramp up to three or four or five out of 25. Same amount of effort, but a huge return, a huge impact on your sales volume. This is the piece of the puzzle we call quality. This is the piece that if you get it, will totally transform your sales team and your sales results. However, like most things, where there is a high reward, there is also hard work, hard effort attached. Changing behavior, changing what the individual does to change the impact of their interaction. This is not easy work, which is why most managers don't do it. Today I'm going to walk you through understanding what it really takes to change people's behavior. I'm going to share with you some learning models and really give you a full-on education in the short amount of time that we have as to all the things that you need to do in order to improve the sales interactions of your salespeople and thereby drive a more impactful outcome. Folks, as I'm sitting here, I'm hearing you say, well, hold on a minute, Ian. We train our people. We send them on training courses. We take them on conferences. We get in guest speakers. We, we invest in online training. There's a whole host of things we do to improve their capability. Well, my question is, great. Well, 
what is the real impact of that? Has that really changed your results at the end of the day? I mean, think about it just for a moment. How many of you have, over the years, attended a sales training session, a workshop, a seminar? Over the years, how many of you have attended sales training of any kind? And I'm sure pretty much all of you. Well, here's the key question. How much of that knowledge really stuck? When you consider the amount of training that was delivered, say in that two-day session or the one-day session, the amount of knowledge that was actually put across, how much of that did we really take on board and actually truly apply? So why is that? Because as you'll see in this session, that to get people to change behavior is one of the biggest challenges that you will face as a sales performance coach. But all that being said, in today's session, we're going to show you all the activities that you need to A, know about, and B, implement if you want to create effective, sustainable behavioral change with your salespeople. And the bottom line is this, if sales training really worked, and I should know, I used to be a sales trainer, if sales training really worked, wouldn't there be an absolute plethora of sales trainers out there? Wouldn't you every single year send your people on a new sales training course because you absolutely knew you were guaranteed to get a return on your investment? Right now, sales training is a bit like going to the casino. You put down your chips and you hope that you win. Well, today we're going to talk about what you need to do in order to win. What are the steps that you need to implement to improve the impact that your people have in their sales interactions. So without any more ado, let's dive into today's session. So up until now, you would have probably had between four and five personal implementation coaching sessions. So if you haven't had all four or if you haven't got your fifth one booked in, make sure that that happens. Take advantage of your personal implementation coach to help you to implement what you're learning. Folks, by now you definitely must have completed your skills audit. In fact, today is all about developing skills, so it will be more relevant to you if you've completed that skills audit of your salespeople. You also would have been through four web clinics, and if you haven't been through them yet, my recommendation is, again, go into your Sales Coach Academy learning site and review all four of the web clinics. They're very, very powerful lessons and will help you to drive sales forward. Also by now, we have had three of our four conference coaching calls. So remember again, folks, if you have any questions, you want to either send them to me or ask them on the group conference coaching call. And these are any questions you have with regards to coaching, with regards to selling. So this is where you get answers to those sales challenges that are keeping you up at night. Also by now, you would have set your clear expectations and boundaries with all of your team, as well as your boss, and you've completed the highly productive sales teams only play above the line learning session. And by now, you should be starting to see evidence of that session within your team. They should be catching each other and pulling each other up in terms of their behavior, in terms of their language and most importantly, in terms of their attitude. And then also, based on the last web clinic we did, which was around sales productivity, you, by now, should be working on, if not completed, your sales productivity, as well as your sales pipeline audits. And the final thing I want to mention is, by now we would have had all the feedback that we're likely to get from your salespeople. So if you haven't had your feedback from your coach, regarding the way that your salespeople perceived your coaching ability before you started this program, then make sure when you speak to your personal implementation coach, they walk you through that 360 feedback. So, as you'll recall, we are currently using the Profitable Sales Revenue Generation Formula 
which is revenue at margin equals productivity multiplied by quality multiplied by motivation. We are using this formula to drive our revenue forward and we're really applying the formula to our coaching. So in the previous web clinic we looked at how do we drive the P? How do we drive productivity? What are the things that we need to do to ramp up the productivity of our sales team? And we said that really the P is the low-hanging fruit. That's probably the quickest and the easiest place to start if you're looking to drive your revenue line forward. So why is this? Because this is typically where you have capacity. This is where you have salespeople who are under-delivering in terms of really the amount of activity that they need to do in order to drive the revenue goals that you're looking for. So today we're going to focus our efforts on the Q, which is how do we drive the quality of the interactions of our salespeople with their prospects and with their customers. So typically we would think of these as the skills or the capability of our people. When we look at our profitable sales revenue generation formula, this is the Q element of that formula. And so really what we're going to be covering today is we're going to look at how we drive sales by developing our people's capabilities. So where the P in the formula is all about increasing productivity, the capacity of your people to do more. Well, today is about increasing the capability, the skills of your people to extract more, to optimize what it is they're actually doing. In order to do this, we're going to look at the four levels of salespeople capability. So we're going to show you how there's currently already four levels of salespeople within your team in terms of their capability. And really, as the sales performance coach, you need to understand at what level your people are playing at in order to make some really crucial decisions as to whether it's worth your time and effort to invest the time and effort into those people. So then we're going to look at really why most selling skills development fails and really how to use the learning ladder and two other learning models which I'm going to cover with you in terms of what it really takes to change behavior and thereby impact the revenue line. So we'll be looking at coaching and how you use coaching to develop capability. Because there's more than enough research out there telling us that coaching is really the number one tool that you as a sales manager have to really develop the capabilities and change the behavior so that you can really drive that cue forward. All right, so as we dive into our session today, I want to take you back all the way back to your very first day in sales. So just go back there in your mind. And I want you just to imagine for a moment, whether it happened to you or not, that on your very first day of sales, you were sent on an induction training program. And they were going to teach you about the company, about their products, and maybe throw in a little bit of sales training here or there. Now, just for the purposes of this exercise, Imagine that you were training with another 99 salespeople around the country. Now here's what ultimately will happen to that group of salespeople. First thing we'll notice is that out of the 100 salespeople all attending induction that day, there'll be a group of salespeople whom we call the Rainmakers. Now, these typically number between 2 and 5%. So, between 2 and 5 of your group are what we call naturally gifted, naturally talented salespeople. So, these are people with an innate gift. These are the people that will make sales whatever, wherever, and for whomever they sell. These are the Roger Federer's, the Tiger Woods of sales. Sales is what they were born to do. They're naturally gifted. And the fact is they only make up between 2 and 5% of the sales population. Now within your group, 
and there's a good chance that you are part of this class of people. The next group we're going to look at is what we call solid citizens. And typically these would be made up of around about 18 to 25 percent of the group that you were with. And these salespeople are successful because they've been around for long enough. They, they've gone through and they've done the hard yards and they've now got experience. So these are experienced salespeople with many years of industry knowledge and experience and let's face it, street smarts behind them. So they've developed their knowledge and skills over time. They've developed probably a network of relationships and over the years have either trained themselves or have been well trained and most of this group whether they know it or not will be following some form of premeditated and tested sales process now whether that process is accurate for today's times or not that's a question for another time the point is they're actually following some form of sales process and as a result they know that if they just follow the recipe stick to their knitting they'll come out with the results at the end now between 20 and 30 people that were on that induction training program with you are what we call lemons and the fact is these people were never going to make it in sales and chances are they're no longer in a sales position many of these people stick around in sales for quite a while because what happens is especially during good times they will stumble over ready-made sales. So typically they will be at the right place at the right time and just happen to pick up a sale. And so this is what kept them in sales for possibly as long as they remained. The bottom line is that these lemons will never make it. They were never cut out for sales. And then the final group, which make up between 40 to 50% of the people that were in your class, are what we call the potentials. And as with the potential, they could go either way. And unfortunately, the vast majority of potentials go the way of the lemons. Why? Because potentials need training. They need coaching. Often they suffer from the fear of rejection. They suffer from core reluctance. And if they don't get that piece sorted, then they will fail in sales. And unfortunately, for the sales managers that manage these potentials and for the organizations that have hired these people, many of them hang around for years, really before they get found out as never really having what it takes to really make it in selling. And the key to potentials is they must be willing to learn and to change. So many times I'll speak to a sales manager and I'll query one of her salespeople and I'll be told, no, this person really has so much potential. Just, just need to give him another couple of months. Well, here's the problem with potential. You cannot bank potential. So the key to look at when you're looking at potential is not whether you feel they have potential or not. The key is, are they willing to learn and are they willing to change? Because if they're not willing to learn or change, then really they're going to fall into the bucket called lemons and it's pointless you wasting your time and your effort with them. So what are we saying? We're saying that when you look at your sales team as you have it right now, you have four classes of people within your team. Now you may not be lucky enough to have a rainmaker on your team, but no doubt you've been in sales long enough to have come across them. And, and many times when we get a rainmaker, we want to clone them. Or in some cases we want to shoot them because they can be quite trying. So most of your team then will probably be made up of, you'll have a few solid citizens on your team and you'll have a few potentials. You might even have a lemon or two. The trick here is to determine which people you have on your team so that you can decide whether it's worth your time and effort to invest in them in terms of the effort that it's going to take to coach them and change their behavior. Because the fact of the matter is that your time is limited and so you need to be very sure that if you're going to be investing your time, which is really your greatest resource that you have, you need to make sure you're directing it into the right people. So if you've chosen to invest your time in supporting and coaching an individual to improve their capability, then you're going to need to understand some of the theories and some of the principles 
behind what it takes to change behavior. So let's just talk about what it takes to change somebody's behavior. And in fact, what we know is there are three components that govern an individual's behavior and whether they change or not. So the first one is, is awareness. And what we're saying here, typically for a salesperson is, is that they must become aware that they need to change up what they're doing. However, they may lack the desire or they may lack the skill to actually change. So, yes, they become aware, but that doesn't mean to say that they want to do it or that they have the skill to make the change. The second area is the skill area. So, here we have salespeople who are aware that they need to change up what they're doing. And these people actually have the skills, so they can actually do it. However, they lack the desire or the will to change. So let me give an example of what I'm talking about. Working with a client right now, and they are, it's a call center, and they receive incoming inquiry calls, which they have to convert into sales. So we invested a tremendous amount of time, effort, and dollars in creating an introduction for the salespeople to make, which had sales psychology built in to increase the individual on the phone's credibility in the eyes of the prospect. So what we found was that some people grabbed hold of the script and practiced and practiced and practiced it and went out and read it just as was, and over time they made it their own. So they went through the stages of learning and ultimately came to the point where they were on autopilot and were able to say the script as it was in their own language and in their own voice. However, we had some salespeople who were relatively successful and as a result they didn't have the desire to want to go through the pain of what it takes to actually learn a script word for word until you can get to the point where it can become your own. And so they kept doing what they've always been doing and, and therefore they kept getting the same results they've always been getting. And it was only until we were able to prove to them that in fact not using that script was actually costing them money that we actually drove the desire to change. And this is the next piece, this is the motor. So here we have a situation where the salesperson has the awareness of the requirement to change up what they're doing and they are motivated, however they lack the skills to do so. So some people can, and the truth is some people can't. There are some salespeople that just don't have the bandwidth in order to grasp the concept and take the tactic to a new level where it really has impact. So in essence, this means there are three questions you've got to be asking. Number one, you've got to be asking, are they aware that there's a gap? Are they aware that there is a deficiency? Because if they can't see it, then that's the piece you need to coach them in on. That's where you need to help them to get a vision of the gap. That's where they need to self-discover their blind spot and how much that blind spot is actually costing them. And the second question is, do they have the skills? So if they don't have the skills, then are they willing to go through and do what it takes to develop that skill and take that skill to a level where they can perform it on call. And then the final key is, are they motivated? Do they actually really want to do it? So, so not just giving you lip service. Do they really want to go through the effort that it's going to take to change their behavior and incorporate the new skills into their selling repertoire? So folks, essentially there are eight things that you want to be doing when you are going to develop the cue or the capability and we're going to chunk these down and break them down so that you get a better understanding but for right now I just want to give you an overview. The first one really is motivation. So this is where through self-discovery they come to the awareness that there is a skill gap as we've just discussed. Because if there's no motivation if there's no willingness to do, if there's no willingness to change, then really you uh, are pushing the proverbial uphill. And then the next area is once you actually have got their motivation, and yes, now they are ready, they want to take on the new skill, then you have to give them both a context 
for where the skill fits as well as the content and you've got to match your delivery to the individual's learning style. In a later training we'll cover this but for right now just understand that there are four types of learners. Probably the best way to really get a handle on this is I want you as I go through the descriptions of these learners just do a bit of self-reflection and see what type of learner you are. So first off we have what we call the why learner. So these are learners that need to know, they've got to understand why, why am I doing this? And then we have the what learners and these are the people that like all the facts, all the detail, the, the models, the, the science, the research behind it. And then you have a large group of people and these are the people that just want to know how. Give me the three or four steps, this is how to do it. And then finally you get another group of learners which are what we call the what now learners. So they understand why, they understand what, they understand how. They just want to know, okay, what do I need to do now? When I walk out of the office today, what do I need to do to start making this happen? Then you have to apply the T-stop coaching model, and I'll go through that with you later in today's presentation. And then the bottom line is for them to get the skill, for them to integrate this new skill, and for them to convert that skill into a regular behavior, whether they like it or not, it's going to take practice, drill, and rehearse. Practice, drill, and rehearse. Practice, drill, and rehearse. You know, when I first got into sales, I had a sales manager, and he made me learn the Tom Hopkins, I want to think it over technique, word for word. And to this day, I can recite it word for word. So if you woke me up at four o'clock in the morning and said, I want to think it over, I'd go, well, that's fine. Obviously, you wouldn't take your time to think this thing over unless you're seriously interested, since I'm sure you're not telling me that just to get rid of me. Can I assume you're going to give this very careful consideration? So just to clarify my way of thinking, was there something specific that I forgot to cover? Was it maybe the product or the service that you think I will render? Seriously, level with me. Could it possibly be the money? Now, I know that technique word for word. Now that sounds very scripted, the way I've just delivered it. However, if someone says to me now, I want to think it over, I immediately go into, I put on my best Robert De Niro, and I'll go, well, that's, that's fine, John. I mean, obviously you're not going to invest your time to think this whole thing over unless you're seriously interested. And I mean, I'm sure you're not telling me that just to get rid of me, so can I assume then that really you're going to give this very careful consideration? So, John... Help me out for a moment, just to, just to clarify my way of thinking. What was it specifically that you wanted to think about? I mean, was it maybe something I've, I haven't covered here? Was it maybe you have a concern about the service that uh, you think you're going to get from me? Or, or, or seriously, John, seriously, level with me. Could it possibly be the money? Now, that's the technique. But in order to get that technique, it took me... Days and days and days and days and days and days and days of practice, draw and rehearse. And this is sometimes what needs to happen for your people to integrate the learning into their own nature. And so step number five is then, we have to work with the individual to develop a plan for implementation. So over the next two weeks, this is what I'm going to do, this is how I'm going to do it, and these are the resources that I'm going to need in order to make it happen. So you're looking for them to go out and apply the tactic, apply the technique. And then they're going to come back and at your next coaching session you're going to review and have a look at the impact, what worked, what didn't work. And as a result then you're going to modify the behavior. So that's just a, a broad overview of what it takes to really develop the cue. And so really when you look at these eight steps up against the way we typically have done sales training in the past. It's no wonder that sales training in and of itself fails. And how do we know? Well, there's a tremendous body of research that's about that says that 85 to 90 percent of sales training has no lasting impact after 120 days. And in fact, according to the Xerox Corporation, 87% of new skills are lost within the first month of the training. So by way of an analogy, imagine that you love strawberries and you just went down to the grocery shop and you bought a punnet of 10 
plump, juicy, ripe strawberries. When you get them home and you unpack them, out of those ten, only two are edible. All the rest are rotten. That's the equivalent of what we're talking about here. We also know that up to 80% of new skills are lost rarely within the first week of training if they're not used. And most of the time they're not used. Why? Because you've gone a sales training course and so the course finishes on a, a Thursday, get back, you spent the Friday in your office cleaning up, then you've got Saturday, Sunday, it's the weekend. By the time you come back, it's Monday, you've got an inbox full of fires you've got to sort out. And then the first time you're actually going to really look at implementing what you were taught on the seminar is a week later. And as I said, research shows that up to 80% of those skills are lost. We also know that 85% of sales training actually fails to deliver a positive return on investment. So when organizations invest in sales training, they do it with an idea that they're going to get a positive return. But we know 85% of training doesn't deliver. So these are frightening statistics. Because often the training is delivered in such a way that one is given verbal instructions and they fail to really deliver without real-world application. People learn skills on the job, not in the classroom. Also, as we discovered earlier, the training itself must make a connection with the individual salesperson based on their own self-discovery of their own skill gaps in order to accomplish their goals. In other words, their motivation to want to close that skill gap. Because the ability to sell, really, folks, isn't just the result of knowledge. In fact, more often than not, it's a matter of internal beliefs which then drive unconscious behavior. So that when under the duress of selling, and let's face it, for many of us, selling can be stressful. And so when one is under the duress of selling, then often what happens is that we tend to revert back to old, comfortable, and dysfunctional habits and behaviors. So we become product-focused or transaction-focused in terms of our behaviors and our selling style. And literally, we forget everything that we've learned in terms of the consultative sale. So even though we've taught them, go in with no agenda, ask needs-finding questions, let's really understand where they're coming from. What happens is, under the stress of that sales environment, we talk. We talk, 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 talk. Folks, fundamentally, improving sales performance is not simply about building skills. More often than not, it's actually about changing very specific types of individual behavior. And in order to actually get to that level where you do shift behavior, well, implementation coaching is required. Because, hey, let's face it, if one could just read a book or, or listen to a CD to gain a skill, well, then we'd all be playing golf like Tiger Woods. Not that he's having such a good run at the moment. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the four levels of learning, which will give you some insight as to why maybe, even though you've delivered the tools and techniques in the best possible way, in the best possible environment, why you're still not really getting the kind of traction you're looking for. No doubt at some point in your life you've been exposed to what is commonly known as the four levels of learning and sometimes it's also known as Maslow's learning ladder although there's a lot of doubt as to whether it really was Maslow that developed this particular learning model. But anyway, the first level of learning as you probably would know is what we call unconscious incompetence. So this is when you don't even know that you don't even know what you're doing. So really, you're not really aware of the existence of, or, or even the relevance of the skill required. So here we're saying that you're not even aware that you have a particular deficiency in a particular area. So often what happens is we can actually deny the relevance or even the usefulness of the skill. And so really, the first step is to become conscious of our incompetence before the development of the new skill or learning can even begin. So I thought to illustrate this whole idea, I'll go back to when I initially taught my son how to drive a manual motor car. So he'd been saving up and he went out and bought himself a manual motor car. 
<laughs> the only trouble is he'd only learned on an automatic. So we go out for our first drive in the car, and I take the car and I drive it to a certain point, and he says to me, okay, Dad, I'm ready to go. I said, you sure? You don't want some instruction here? No, no, I'm ready to go. I've done this on PlayStation many times. I know what I'm doing. Okay? There's the unconscious competence. He doesn't even know that he doesn't know what he's doing. What happens then is he gets into the driver's seat, turns on the ignition, and puts in the clutch, puts the car into gear, and of course he pops the clutch, and we do the bunny hop all the way down the street until ultimately he stalls the car. At this point, he has now become what we call a conscious incompetent. In other words, he's now become aware of the existence and the relevance of learning the skill of clutch and accelerator control. And because of his attempt at trying to drive, he's now become aware of his own deficiency in this area. He's also come to the realization that he needs to improve his skill in this area so that he can be an effective driver. Also, because of that experience, he now has a, a measure to the extent of his own deficiency when it comes to driving a manual car. And because he's seen me do it, he now has a measure of what level of skill is required to achieve his own competence. And at this point then, because he's invested so much money in the car and because he needs to learn how to drive, he commits to learning and to practicing the new skill in order to move into what is known as the conscious competence stage, where he now knows that he knows what he is doing, as opposed to the conscious incompetence stage where he self-discovered that he didn't know what he was doing. So having driven around the area for a good half an hour or so, he slowly started to become competent. And within a week or two of regular practice, he was conscious of his skills and he was pretty much performing them reliably. That being said, he still needed to concentrate and to think in order to drive manually. Obviously, he could now drive without my assistance. The, the thing, though, with conscious competence is that he wasn't really reliably able to drive unless he thinks about it. So using the clutch and the accelerator still is not second nature. It hasn't become automatic. However, he was certainly able to demonstrate to his mother that he could drive a manual car. Although that being said, it's unlikely that he'd be able to teach his friends how to drive a manual. And so for him to improve, and obviously, again, he had the motivation to keep going, he needed to practice his driving until he became what we call unconsciously competent. So this is where he now moves into automatic. And we know that practice, drill, and rehearse is the single most effective way to move from conscious competence to unconscious competence. So what is unconscious competence then? Well, it's really when your skill has become so practiced that it enters the unconscious parts of your brain. It's just second nature. And so what happens is, because you are on autopilot, you can actually do certain skills while actually doing something else. And of course, being at that level of unconscious competence, you now have the knowledge to be able to teach others the skill. Although the trouble with that is because you're now unconsciously competent, you may actually have difficulty explaining exactly how you do it because the skill has become largely instinctive. And so as coaches, this is often why we struggle to impart a sales skill to one of our salespeople. We just don't get why they don't get it because for us it's already just purely instinctual. And, and so because of the fact that we do just move into autopilot, it really gives rise to the need to be checked up on periodically against any new standards that may apply to the skill. And again, just to tie it back to the story of my son driving, he arrives home one day from university and we're having dinner and he says to me, Dad, you know, something really strange happened today. Yeah, what was it? He said, well, I got in the car at uni and I drove all the way home and I actually don't remember anything about the journey. 
aha, because he was on autopilot. He is now at the level of unconscious competence. So now we have to move into an entirely new phase of where we have to now teach him about defensive driving, where you have to stay vigilant all the time. And that, again, is an upgrade of his skills. So really, there's two key learnings that, for us as coaches, we need to take from this model of learning. And the first one is that everybody gets excited. Once they become aware, yes, now I'm excited, I want to do, I want to do, I want to do. But there is a dip, and there's a big dip between being consciously incompetent and knowing that you don't know what to do, and working through that dip, putting in the effort, putting in the yards, doing the practicing, doing the drilling, doing the rehearsing, until you come out of that dip and become consciously competent. And in order for someone to go through that, this then is the second key learning, and that is they must be motivated. So if you think of all the things that you've started and then stopped, the reason you didn't get yourself through that dip is because you were not committed enough to go through the pain of the dip. So here's the thing about learning how to sell. Yes, there are books. Yes, there are workshops. Yes, there are seminars. And yes, one can gather the concepts and conceptualize them and intellectualize them and agree with them. But until and unless one actually applies them, until and unless one actually takes the concept out into the marketplace and we test it, only then does the learning of how to sell begin. Because when it comes to learning, we take in information through our senses, but ultimately we learn by doing, and then we of course reflect on those experiences that we've had. And I guess all learning theory can ultimately be traced back to Confucius around 450 BC when he said, tell me and I will forget, show me and I may remember, involve me and I will understand. So with that in mind, if as we said before, 80% of learning happens on the job, then as a sales performance coach, if you're going to be training your people on how to sell, you basically need to understand the experiential learning model. So we're going to take a look at the experiential learning model. And whilst, folks, there are many learning models out there, I've kind of synthesized them all down into really the key things that you need to understand about experiential learning so that you can take that information and apply it and use it to improve the impact and the effectiveness of your own development of your people. So when looking at experiential learning, there are only four key areas that happen in the experiential learning cycle, and we're going to cover what those four key areas are. And really, they're basically common sense. I'm just going to put a language around them so that you have a process to follow. But effectively, learning experientially really depends on two key elements. First of all, how we think about things, and second of all, how we do things. So learning experientially begins with doing. So now I've got the theory down, now I've got all the intellectual concepts down, now my learning begins when I start to do. And so in the ideal world, you learning by doing, you learning by practicing, you doing some exercises, you role playing, you are actually getting involved and actually trying out and trying on the concept, the tactic, the technique. And so now that we've had an opportunity to play, to practice, to do the exercises in a safe environment, at this stage typically one moves to the next phase of the experiential learning model, which is reflection. So here is where we go into thinking and feeling mode about what we've just learned. So how did we feel about what just happened? What do we think about just what happened? And so once we think about what we've just learned and we process the feelings that we've discovered about what we've just learned, the next stage really is to go out and apply what we've just learned. So this is the piece within the experiential learning model where the rubber hits the road. This is where we take the information out into the street and we put it out there. 
This is where we use it in real life. And as a result of putting it out there and practically applying our knowledge, we're going to get feedback. And this feedback is going to come to you in the form of either from an external source, i.e. a coach, a mentor, someone who's actually listening in or watching what it is you're actually doing, or the feedback's actually going to come from the environment itself, from the reaction of what it is you're getting as a result of applying the tactic or the technique. And then we take that feedback and we make adjustments to what it is we're doing and slowly but surely our learning evolves and then we start the cycle all over again. So by way of an example, let's say you're working with one of your salespeople and the key area that you've decided to work on is how to leave compelling voicemail messages to get a favorable response from the individual you're calling. Alright, so first thing is we're going to go through the theory. We're going to teach them what it takes to be compelling. We're going to teach them all about curiosity and what they need to do to spark curiosity. We're going to teach them about all the research that they need to do in order to make their messages relevant to that specific prospect. So once we're done with the theory, then we'll have them do an exercise. So for the purposes of this exercise, let's assume we get them to actually write out a message. They need to choose a prospect, they need to do research on the prospect, they need to come up with an angle that's going to pique curiosity, and they need to write out a message. So they create a message, and then we get them to practice. So we get them on the phone, and they leave a message. So maybe they call themselves, they call you, they leave this message. On playing the message back, the learner now moves into a thinking, feeling mode where now they're thinking, wow, is that what I sound like? Gee, that doesn't sound really good. That was really stilted. That sounded really scripted. That sounded terrible. I hate the way I sound recorded. And they start to get feelings and thoughts around their own message delivery. On the other hand, they could also think, wow, that's really good. That's really positive. I really like that. So there's a mixture of thoughts and feelings that the individual is going to have having listened to their message. And your role now as a sales performance coach is to get them to explore those thoughts, those feelings, so that you can get them out on the table and actually put them to bed. Otherwise, they just keep going round and round in circles in the individual's head. So having explored that, we now want to get the individual to take their learnings and to go out and apply their new technique into the real world. So John, when you're on the phone today, I want you to leave this message every time you get somebody's voicemail. So that afternoon, John gets on the phone and he makes his calls and he gets a whole lot of voicemails. And so now, of course, when that happens, he now leaves his new compelling voicemail message. And so as a result of this, a couple of things are going to happen. He's going to get some feedback. What feedback is he going to get? Well, the market will give him feedback. If his message is compelling, if his message is powerful, then a certain amount of people will call him back. Not everyone's going to call him back, which is possibly what he was expecting. And if only two out of his 20 calls call him back, again, he might consider that, when he's reflecting on that, as a failure, and therefore just want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Maybe saying or maybe thinking things like, yeah, you see, this stuff never works for me. But on the other hand, he might get a half a dozen callbacks, in which case he thinks, well, this stuff really does work. Either way, it's our role now as the coach to go back and along with John, let's listen to his messages and let's listen for those very key elements that we taught. On listening to the message, we can say, okay, we can probably tweak this word here. There's too many ums and ahs there. Maybe what we need to do is bring the phone number from, instead of playing at the end of the message, bring it up front to the beginning of the message, etc., etc. So we as coaches then provide them with feedback. And then, of course, we send them out to do it all over again. And once again, we move them through the experiential learning cycle, continually evolving, 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 until the tactic has become a natural part of the individual salesperson's repertoire. Folks, That's the experiential learning model. Firstly, they have to take the information, 
then they have to practice implementing the concept, the tool, the tactic through exercises, through practice. Then they want to reflect on what it is they've learned. And then they're going to take that information, they're going to take the tactic, they're going to take the technique, and they're going to implement it into the real world and ultimately get feedback on their delivery. And then they begin the cycle all over again, evolving, evolving, until eventually they get to the point where they're just on autopilot. So if that's the experiential learning model, if that's the experiential process that people go through to really learn the implementation of a tactic, a technique, then we as sales coaches, we ourselves need a model to help to implement, to train them and guide them and coach them and mentor them and support them through that cycle. And the model that we use is what is known as the T-stop coaching model. Folks, the beauty of the T-stop model, it's the easiest model, it's the most simple to implement, it's the most simple to use, and it's really the most simple to remember. So how will you remember it? Well, what do you do when you come to a T-junction? You stop, hence T-stop. So what does T-stop stand for? And you can probably fill this in as we go along because it is that simple. The T in the T-stop model, the first T is you need to tell them. So this is where we explain to them the concept. This is when we show them the models. So this is when we go through the theory of what it is they need to do. This is the what. So as you'll recall, earlier on in today's web clinic, we looked at the why and the what and the how, and of course the what now, in terms of getting our message across to all four learning styles. Well, this is really the what and also the why. You want to give them the reasons why we're doing it so they understand the logic. If there is sales psychology built into the logic, they need to understand that. So really, we can say that the T in the T-stop model covers off both the why and the what of the four learning styles. In other words, as you'll recall, when we deliver our teaching, we want to make sure we cover off the why we're doing it, the what it is we're actually doing. We also want to make sure we cover off the how to do it, as well as what that individual needs to do right now to take action and implement what they've just been taught. And as you'll see, the beauty of this T-stop model is that it actually covers off all four of those learning styles. So to reiterate then, the T covers off both the why as well as the what. Now the S in the T-stop model, then is for show. So here's where the learner needs to witness. They need to see the tactic or the technique or whatever methodology we're teaching. They need to see it in action. The learner needs to get a visual imprint of what success looks like. And once they've been shown, the next T is they need to try. They need to give it a go. They need to try. This is where they are now going to practice. Now during their practice you're going to enact the O which stands for observe them in action. And here you're going to be looking for both what's working as well as obviously what's not working. What do they need improvement in? And then finally the P in the T-stop model stands for praise or redirect. So we always want to find some aspect of what they've done to praise, because you want to give them good positive feedback and reinforce good behaviors. Even if their presentation was hopeless, there must be one or two things that they did right. And then what are the things that they need improvement on? And that's really a terrific question to ask them once they've completed their practice. We actually say, okay, let's see, what worked? And what do we need to improve on? And so that's really the model. So we start by telling, then we show, we get them to try. While they're trying, we observe, and then we praise and redirect. That's it. It is that simple. Folks, this is the easiest coaching, training in the field, or just pure training model ever developed. And we call it the T-stop model.
Great. So now we've trained them, we've coached them, we've given them the tools, we've taught them the methodologies, we're having them go out and use them. But to what end? What are they shooting for? And how will they know it when they get there? So really, one of the key critical elements of this whole Q puzzle, if you want to really ramp up the capability, the quality of your salespeople's interaction, you have to measure their success. And the measure we want to apply, the measure we want to use, is their conversion rate. Because this is the real measure of how they are actually performing. And the conversion rate measure we want to use is we want to measure the conversion rate between each gate of your sales process. You want to measure the macro, which is the whole sales process. So you want to measure from the time they discover the opportunity till the opportunity actually closes. And then you want to measure the micro, which is the specific area, the specific gate you want to move forward. Folks, don't overcomplicate it. Okay? You want two measures. You want the main measure, which is their total conversion rate, which is how many opportunities do they open versus how many opportunities do they actually bring home as sales. And the other measure you want to measure is the specific gate that you're looking to move forward. Which of those sales process gates, if we were to improve, would improve the outcome of the whole sales process? Because if you can work on a specific skill that's really going to translate into increasing the conversion rate of one of the gates in your sales process, this is where you really start to see spikes in your sales revenue. If you're going to measure it, you must track it. Currently, if you don't have a means of tracking conversion rates, then do it manually. But you must track and measure. You must track what it is they're doing. How many calls are they making? How many opportunities are they opening? How many of those opportunities are converting to appointments? How many of those appointments are converting to the second appointment? How many of those second appointments are converting to a proposal? How many proposals are converting to sales, etc., etc.? The beauty is once you've been keeping your conversion rates for a while, now you've got averages that you can compare people against. You can establish norms of what is good performance, what is great performance, what is poor performance. When does somebody meet expectations? When do they exceed expectations? Or when do they fall below expectations? And so that now you can measure all of your salespeople against these norms. When you bring new people in, you can instantly put them through a measurement and get a sense of the areas they need to improve on in order to bring them up to speed of the rest of the group. So conversion rate is how we measure the improvement of the queue, in the improvement of the capability of the individual salesperson. It means that they're getting more traction, more value out of every activity that they're implementing. And as that old management dictum would say, what gets measured gets done. When you're measuring, you're focusing, and you're gaining improvement. In one of those key sales performance areas that can have the greatest impact and return in terms of you accomplishing your sales targets. And so for more information on conversion rates and creating sales process gates, I refer you to the last web clinic we did, which was web clinic number four, optimizing the productivity of your salespeople, in which we went into sales process gates and conversion rates in greater detail. All right, so let me summarize everything we've covered off today. And let's face it, I've dumped a lot on you. Now I'm going to summarize everything into nine steps that you need to implement if you want to coach for skill change, if you want to be coaching the Q, if you want to increase the capability of your salespeople. Step number one is the individual being coached must agree, and obviously self-discovery here is best, on a particular skill for development. And the easiest place to start is begin with the low-hanging fruit, because they'll get some runs on the board, they'll start to get some traction, and they will begin to believe in the coaching process. Then 
Once you've agreed on which particular skill it is that you want to develop, you want to set a smart development goal around that. So by way of an example, my goal is to be able to do A, B, C skill by a certain date to a skill level of 4 out of 5. And then having set the goal, you want to explain the skill. So you want to cover off the why, the what, the how, and the what now. And you want to use the T-stop model. So again, this is where you're going to tell them, then you're going to show them, then you're going to get them to try. And while they're trying, you're going to observe them in action. And then you're going to praise progress. And then you're also going to offer them some redirection and point out areas that they can improve on. Folks, right here in step number five, this is the critical piece. It's the practice, it's the drill, and it's the rehearse. Practice, drill, and rehearse. Practice, drill, and rehearse. Practice, drill, and rehearse. And now once they've practiced it and they've drilled it and rehearsed and you feel they're ready to now go and apply it in the real world, you want to talk to them about, let's plan your implementation. Let's think about how we're going to implement this. Then you want them to go out and apply it. And, and the secret to application, folks, is have them, instead of thinking of themselves as a salesperson, what you want to try and do is get them to think of themselves as doing research. They're just researching to see if the tactic works. That kind of takes a lot of the emotional pain out of whether they win or lose. So it actually prevents a lot of the rejection because here we're just testing. We're just testing, does this work, does that work? If we improve this, would this be better or would that be better? It's almost like you're putting on your marketing cap and you're just split testing. So you're testing an ad with a particular headline and you're testing the same ad with a different headline. You're not emotionally attached to the ad, we're just testing to see which one pulls more. So this is a good headspace to put your people into when they start the application of what it is you're teaching. And then of course you're going to review progress, which is step number eight. See where they're at, what's working, what's not working, what do they need to improve upon. And then finally you want to set a new action goal. So let's set a new goal. You go out now into the field and use these changes that we've just worked out. So go out and try it so that we can, over time, evolve the skill so eventually they'll have it down pat. Those then are the nine steps to coach for skill change. So these are the nine steps that you need to take if you want to increase the capability of your salespeople, if you want to drive that cue forward so that you can really smash your sales numbers. Okay, so here's your growth work. This is what I want you to do. This is the what now. The first thing I want you to do, if you haven't already done it, is you have to, have to, have to complete the sales skills analysis. This is critical to the development of your queue. You've got to understand what the core 25 skills are that, that your salespeople need if they want to be effective in your marketplace, selling your products and services. Secondly, you want to review the analysis with the individual. And number three, you want to gather their perceptions. So what do they think about where they're at? And then together, you want to select a skill for development. Then, as I said, you're going to set a SMART goal for that skill development. And, and, and I want you to try this as a little spin. Have the coachee actually go out and research options or solutions. Let them go and have a look on the internet for the skills that they're looking to develop. Let them find out more about, as an example, what should they say if they're going to leave a compelling voicemail message. I mean, let's face it, folks, there's no shortage of knowledge and tools and resources out there. Because the basic fact is this. When they actually go out and do the research themselves, they actually start to own it. They start to see all the alternatives. It starts to expand their mind as to all the options available to them. Then you're going to come back and together you'll review the solution. So together you'll determine the why, the what, the how, which is the application, and the what now. And then at this point you're going to apply the T-stop model. Make sure that they practice, drill, and rehearse, PDR. Plan their implementation and set the measure so that they know what success looks like. Then have them go out and apply it, review progress, and then come back 
and set a new action goal. So as we wrap up today's web clinic, make sure you've printed off the PDF that was attached to the invitation for today's web clinic. Then I want you to select one of your salespeople, take anyone, and I want you to go through and I want you to complete this nine step exercise. So first of all, assuming you've done your skills audit, then you're going to sit down with that individual and you're going to agree on a skill to develop. You're going to set a SMART goal around that and then you're going to send them off to go and research that. So that's going to be their first project. What's good about that is it also gives you time to focus on what you're going to do next. So they go off, they do some homework, they get on the internet, they go to the library, they do some research and they come back to you and they need to tell you the why, the what, the how and what they will be doing next. So those are kind of the headings that you want to give them to go and do the research in. Then you're going to apply the T-stop model and then you want to have them practice, drill and rehearse. Practice, drill and rehearse the implementation of the skill and then together you want to sit down with them and plan how they're going to go about implementing what they've just learned. How they're going to apply the skill. And then they're going to go out and actually apply the skill, apply what they've learned in a real life situation. And obviously you will set up a time, if you haven't already, for them to come back and at your next one-on-one -on -one coaching session you're going to review the progress and from there you'll figure out what worked, what didn't work and you'll set new action goals and start the process all over again. So I'm going to end today's web clinic with a quote from Zig Ziglar. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. And the way I see it is like this. If your salespeople keep delivering, keep doing, keep operating at the same level as they're currently delivering, with the same amount of skill, then they can only keep getting more of what they've currently got. And so can you as their sales manager. So if you want to increase your sales by 10%, the question that I will leave you with is, how do you make your people 10% more effective? If you want to increase your sales by 20%, how do you make your salespeople 20% more effective? If you want to increase sales by 30%, You've got to find ways to increase your salespeople's effectiveness by 30%, and so on and so on. For your salespeople to do better, they have to be better. Thanks for showing up today. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Let me ask you this one last question one more time. What will you do today to ensure the success of your sales team tomorrow? Cheerio.